I'm Rosalie Starvish. I'm a water resources engineer with GZA, um, and I'm working with, with Nick on this project as well, so I'll let Nick introduce himself. Yeah, uh, Nick Miller, a fluvial geomorphologist, which is like a geologist that studies rivers. So I study sediment transport and stream flow. And I've been working in Conway for quite a while. This is a meeting about our current project, which ends in June. And it's all about hydraulic and hydrologic modeling of Conway Center. Uh, Rosalie's going to get us started. Um, here is an agenda for today. Um, so we'll talk a little bit first about what, what is hydrologic and hydraulic modeling. Um, and then we'll talk about the um, modeling that we prepared for Conway um, and the results of that modeling, um, including um, the, the various different flood resilience projects that we looked at for Conway Center. And then we'll uh, get into what our next steps are, are to close out this project by the end of June. And we'll have time for some questions. Um, and also, um, everyone will have an opportunity to share um, by kind of a voting process what out of the resilience projects that we're talking about today, what your preferences would be for prior prioritization. And we'll have some time for questions at the end of the presentation. So the overview of the project um, for hydro hydrologic and hydraulic modeling, um, the, the town had participated in a former project that had been funded by the Massachusetts Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program, which is known as the MVP program. So that project ended in 2021, and that did include the preparation of a hydraulic model of the South River. Um, and that um, looked at the South River only, and it was went from uh, just upstream of Johnny Bean Brook confluence to around um, the address of 888 Shelburne Falls Road. Um, and so the results of that modeling effort suggested that there was a significant um, source of flooding to Conway Center. Um, so the town did apply for and were awarded another MVP grant, which allowed for the um, basically incorporating more detail about Pumpkin Hollow Brook into the model. Um, and, and for this project, we're, we focused on Conway Center, um, what are the flood, flood impacts to Conway Center, and what are some mitigation strategies for the area. Um, the development of this type of model, um, it's, never, it's never a 100% perfect simulation of reality. Um, there are always assumptions that have to go into the modeling effort. Um, there's you know, we use as much data as we can get, either that's publicly available using the technology we have today. We have um, very good topographic data that we can get for free, so we incorporate that. Um, and then we try to put in some more time and energy into collecting actual survey data um, to try to get that the model results to be as close to real as possible. Um, but you know, the, the level of effort to get the modeling um, to that level is basically there's the more time and energy you put into it, the, the better product you're going to have. So we've, it's always um, an iterative process to continually improve upon. Um, so as I mentioned, um, some of the work we did under this grant was to collect more detailed um, data by actual field survey. Um, to the right, you can see all those little dots. Um, those are the actual points where um, Nick Nick went out and stood with equipment and you know collected the data. Um, and this information helps refine 
the elevations and understanding, you know, where the land surface is in the project area. Um, and then there's an example of the results of that data on the left um, with the, this is showing the opening of at the Main Street Bridge, and this would be the, the ground surface at the bottom of the river. Um, and this would be the top of the road, I think. Yep, so. that's the road and then the, the high cord, which is the, um, there's like a railing. The you railing, know, yeah. So pedestrians don't fall off the bridge, right? Right, so that's the type of data we collected. Um, I do want to explain what it means when we say hydrolo hy hydrologic and hydraulic. Um, the hydrology or the hydrologic model is the step of taking the precipitation that falls on the ground and estimating what happens to that water um, and what the resulting flow rate is. So this chart here is showing um, inches of rain. So in this event, there was about a half an inch of rain and it, it comes down, you know, over time, it tracks like when it started raining and then the heaviest rain and then it, it tapers off. And then this shows what happens when that rain collects on the watershed, results in a flow rate um, at whatever point you're interested in, in the river. Um, so this is showing the, the flow and then it peaks. The peak flow in the river happens a little bit after when the rain, the peak rain fell. And so this is what we're trying to get at when we talk about a hydrologic model. Um, and then the hydraulic model is looking at what happens on the land surface and in the river when you plug in these flow rates. Um, and so it will tell us, um, you know, what is the depth of the water and how fast is it going? What's the velocity? So a lot of this stuff is like pretty technical, right? But you've experienced it, you know, you are in your house on Saturday, it's raining all day, right? The river takes a little while to come up. On the South River, it's very flashy. So it comes up quick, but there is some delay, right? So what you've experienced in living along the South River, that's basically what we're trying to show so graphically. Are the, ax are the X axis is ours? Yes. yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And then what, what, where is the flow measured when you say flow? Uh, so all the flow data, Rosalie's going to get to that in a minute, but um, it's based on a USGS gauge, which is downstream of town that's been there since the mid-1960s or early 1960s. Yeah, I was just wondering how far from town this peak is. Well, I, I mean, this here is just an example, um, but we'll provide um, a little bit more information. Um, so as Nick mentioned, there is a stream gauge, um, a USGS gauge, and these dark lines were on the USGS map, so just ignore those. But basically the South River goes like this. Here is Conway Center. Pumpkin Hollow Brook is coming in, and then the river <coughs> goes around like this, and there's a gauge up um, further downstream from Conway Center. Yeah, it's by the second, the lower Reeves Bridge bridge. And we performed, um, we looked at annual peak stream flow from this gauge to um, develop the flows that were used in the model. Um, Did you identify where the incoming gauge is that you have for the center of town? That's the outgoing gauge. Where's the incoming? So there is not an incoming gauge. What we do is uh, look at sub-watershed drainage area. So you can calculate based on the topography how much of that total flow is coming down Pumpkin Hollow Brook, right, and going through like the Maple Street culvert, for example, um, and how much of it is going down Johnny Bean Brook and going through North uh, through Main Poland Road culvert and how much, you know, where all those flows come together basically at Main Street when Pumpkin Hollow comes in. 
So we can, you know, mathematically divide things up in the model. That's, that's how it works. Um, okay, so the right here is a table. Um, I wanted to take a minute to explain a little bit about um, what these terms mean. Um, so the term uh, annual exceedance probability and annual recurrence interval describe the probability of a flow of a certain size occurring in a river. Um, and so when we say that, you know, we, we're looking at a two-year flow or a two-year flood, um, it has an annual exceedance probability of 50%. So what that means is that in any one year period, there's, you know, a one in two chance that you might get a flood of that of that size. Um, but what's important to understand is that, you know, if you did have a 50 year flood, that doesn't mean it only happens once every 50 years. Um, the probability is that it might only happen once in every 50 years. But in reality, if you're if you um, combine probabilistic statistics, what it means that if you looked at a 30-year period instead of a one-year period, you might actually have a 45% chance of that flood occurring. Um, okay, and then this table shows the actual flows that we used in the modeling. Um, so we looked at, you know, a variety of um, probability flows and the flow increases as you move downstream so there's a certain flow in Pumpkin Hollow Brook um, that's indicated in this row here um, and then you know the flow it, um, at Main Street in the South River is shown here. Um, one thing to note is that um, the flow during Irene, the peak flow during Irene at the USGS gauge was about 9,300 CFS. So that kind of gives you a reference point. Yeah, so Irene was almost a 100 year flow. But going back to the slide Rosalie just mentioned, that doesn't mean it's gonna be 100 years before the next Irene. In a 30 year period, there's a 45% chance you could have another Irene size storm. Um, and this is not taking into account climate change. This is taking, um, you know, past, you know, the past 60 years basically as our um, mm -hmm. calibration. Um, and so here's just an example um, of the types of model output we can, that we'll be showing you today. So, um, this is showing the depth along a profile, um, depth of water. And this here is showing a representation of the velocities in the water. So, um, you know, the blue is more of like slow moving velocity. And then you can see where it gets red. Um, that's where the water is moving faster. So in this map, um, this is Main Street. This is the South River. Um, and then this is some flooding area that's showing. Um, and we'll provide more information on the specifics in the next slides. Um, so existing conditions, we'll have Nick get a little bit more into that. Oh, there you go. All right, so um, what we're showing here, again, we modeled all these different flow events, right? So the two year, which happens on average every other year, is kind of a smaller flow, um, kind of like your spring, you know, snow melt sort of event. The 10 year event is pretty large, mm -hmm. and you can see that under existing conditions, the 10 year, so we're in town hall right there. Um, under existing conditions today, the 10 year flow. Um, which is pretty large, um, actually floods a good portion of the village. Now, as we talked about before some people got here, that doesn't mean that you are gonna be standing on your roof 
um, being airlifted out, it just might mean that there's water in your yard, you know, coming up to the foundation. So if you're if you're one of the folks who has a property of interest in this area, um, that's what that means. All right. So this blue is showing flow depth and perhaps where you're sitting or if you look at this online, because this will be posted online, you'll be able to see that there's all these little flow arrows that show the direction of water flow. So there's water coming out of South River here onto this forested floodplain behind the berm. It's getting behind the berm even at the 10 year flow with the berm being there uh, in its existing condition. And then the 100 year flow, um, of course, all that area that was inundated in the 10 year is inundated in the 100 year. Um, the depths are greater and there's more inundation that water surface is higher All right so at the the main street bridge the water depth in the south river channel goes from mm -hmm. seven feet to 13 feet to over 14 feet deep um, in these different events and we're going to be talking about this more as we go through um, there's a lot of different ways to look at this model data. And so that was a map of inundation showing how the water spreads out over an area. Mm -hmm. This is a profile down the river channel showing you the water surface as compared to the ground elevation. So this is the channel. This is the base of the channel on South oh. River. And here's the Main Street Bridge. So at the two year flow event that happens every other year or so, um, the water flows that flows through that bridge and it's not really backed up that much. Um, there's a little bit of backing up here, but not much. Um, at the 10 year flow, which is actually quite a bit higher than the two year, um, you can see how there's a pond where water is held back in elevated upstream of the bridge. And that is even more pronounced at the 100 year event. So we've got a pond upstream, uh, which you can see on here, or you can see, you can't go back. You can't go back, oh, it's why. okay. Uh, which you saw on the previous slide with the, you know, the flooded area upstream of the bridge. Yeah. I'm kind of a peasant here, but are these, are these axes both in feet? And Yes. And the left axis is above sea level, is that what Yes, so this is feet above sea level. Okay. And this is uh and where is zero? This is distance along the transect. So um, approximately this started uh where the old dam is uh behind Baker's store. That's about zero. And <clears throat> at about eleven hundred feet downstream from where I tr started that transect was where the bridge was. And then this goes down to, um, you know, the South River Meadow, kind of like the center of the South River Meadow site. Another question? Yeah. I, I didn't understand that term that you used about what happens just before the bridge in the 10-year and 100-year flood. Yes, it's backwatering. It's, it's like, it's basically damming up the water because what happens is the water has to squeeze through that through that small opening. And so uh, upstream of it, it takes more time for the water to do that. So it basically would look like a pond. Um, and this is just a way to visualize that. So what you're seeing is slow moving water here in this ponded area. Um, that would be depositing sediment because the water s slows down and the sediment's gonna drop out. Um, and then right at the bridge, just downstream of the bridge, you have this hydraulic jump where you've got um, a big increase in velocity because that water now like falls down, you know, quite a bit, reduces its elevation. And it's, as it's squeezing through that bridge, it comes out with force on the downstream end. So this is just one way we visualize that. Before you go it. ahead, um, is this distance the scope of the project that no okay this is just an example this is just an example okay from roughly baker's store down to south river yep. right what is the scope are we talking end to end from ashfield ish down through <clears throat> so natural roots no uh this 
very detailed model goes from above the covered bridge um, by about half a mile or so yep. um, down to um, how far down? Does it go down to the Oxbow? Or I'm not sure. If it we does. showed that earlier. Yes, I think so. Yeah, it goes down. Yeah. And, to, it, and it incorporates Pumpkin Hollow from uh, the swimming pool dam down to the South River. And so, uh, sorry, then, so I'm tr trying to get an understanding then of scope. If this is just a postage stamp look at, um, at how this particular graph or model works, then we're talking a half mile north of the covered bridge, which mm -hmm. actually had been a meadow or a, a lake at one point, down to mm -hmm. Um, Some, it, somewhere along Shelburne Falls Road. Okay, yeah. and there's before somewhere natural might be. Yeah. Say again. Before, before natural roots. Before yeah. natural roots. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, and so this this illustration, uh, the reason that it starts and ends where it does is it's I'm trying to show the influence of the Main Street Bridge, right? And so this is, you know, taking a slice from above the influence of the bridge to below the influence of the bridge. So the oxbow is just beyond the meadow? The, the oxbow is uh, down past where the fire department gets water out of the river and past Emerson Hollow. Uh, the con so the opposite the Harris's property. Yeah, the old Harris farm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, some mm -hmm. other results from the existing conditions model. Mm -hmm. We'll show you a cross section going um, a, across the floodplain through the village. So this one goes from the old tannery building uh, upstream of the Main Street Bridge to Town Hall where we're sitting this morning. Um, and we've got the 10 year flow in green, the 25 year in orange, and the 100 in blue. Um, you can see the water depth in the South River Channel itself. You can see the berm here blocking part of the forested floodplain. And you can see this ends right at Town Hall. This is Academy Hill Road mm -hmm. out front. Um, so in, in under existing conditions, according to the model, and this isn't you know reality, but it's the best simulation of reality, reality that we can you know do with the what we've got in front of us. Uh, during a 10 year flow, the water on Academy Hill Road would be 2.4 and a, 2 .4 feet deep. And then that's a photo. The water on Academy Hill Road, how, how far up by foot? Just, just in front of the town oh, hall. down at the base. Yeah, just right yes. out front, okay. the front door. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's a photo during Irene showing that approximate area. So we also looked at Pumpkin Hollow Brook. And so some of the existing conditions results from Pumpkin Hollow Brook show how the four foot culvert under Old Cricket Hill Road and the slightly larger culvert at Maple Street are also impacting water flow. All right, so the arrow shows you where the culvert is approximately. And you see that same thing with the backwatering or ponding upstream. Um, the ponding upstream of the Maple Street culvert extends further, about 500 feet. Um, and so these culverts are actually holding back water during a 10-year uh, flow event, which is what I'm showing here. Um, so that's good in a way, right? It's holding back some of the water and slowing down its delivery into the South River. Um, but it's bad in a way because right at this point you've got a uh, marked and significant increase in water velocity and scour and if you go out to old cricket hill road you would see that the you know pavement has been damaged and there's some erosion right around the head wall of the culvert right so that's showing us what the model is 
in, in reality is showing us what the model is showing us here, which is that scour increases dramatically downstream of these undersized culverts. And, so um, it's, are you going to address that later? Or uh, mm -hmm. um, So for me, it's a question of how do you resolve that? Because holding water back makes sense for downstream flow, for absorption, water table, um, flood <clears throat> mitigation. But if we're going to have to deal with scour, what are we talking about? A low dam? Is this something we'll address later? Uh, yeah, we'll be talking about this more. Um, but basically, and you can also see it graphically here on a map showing flow depth. This is Old Cricket Hill Road here. And you can see a pond develops upstream of it. Right? And then actually the water isn't really making use of the floodplain here because the channel is so incised um, through that floodplain because of that increase in scour and erosive force um, that you've got a pond upstream, but then you've got a very narrow flow path. So that kind of um, maybe cancels out any benefit of the uh, pond upstream. Right? Same thing is happening at Maple Street here. You've got a pond upstream and then, you know, underutilizing the floodplain in this area as it goes through instead of, you know, um, so there's different things going on when we talk about flooding, right? We talk about flood inundation, it's how far and how deep the water spreads out over the floodplain area. Um, but then there's also fluvial erosion or the erosive power of the water. So in a place like Old Cricket Hill Road or Maple Street, you know, you not only need to think about how high is the water rising up and where is it inundating, but what are the stresses on that crossing, right? So there's a very significant hazard to the crossing because it is having such a profound influence on, you know, water and sediment transport during this 10-year flow event. Um, so we're getting a lot of sediment deposited upstream. Um, it's actually sediment starved immediately downstream, so it's going to increase the erosion along the banks. Um, so there's a, a lot going on, not to mention, you know, habitat issues. Fish can't get up a culvert like that because um, of velocity issues, because of they can't jump so high and, and all sorts of things. All right, but these are all different you know, parameters that we can look at through the model results. Sorry, we're going to kind of bludgeon you with a lot of information, so I apologize uh, for that. Um, but we will have time for questions at the end. Uh, so uh, this is another cross-section of existing conditions. Um, this is the ground surface. This one is actually upstream of the covered bridge on a largely town-owned property. Um, the road uh, 116 is up here. Um, and this low line is a two year flow. And you can see how the two year flow is contained within just the South River Channel. Uh, but once you get up to a 10 year flow, it's actually flooding across a lot of this big uh, forested bar. And that forested bar is an old impoundment sediment surface, we call legacy sediments, because there was an old dam just downstream of the covered bridge, which you can still see today, um, the base of that dam. Mm -hmm. um, so that land area around the covered bridge and upstream is all sediment that was deposited in a pond um, for, a, for an old mill dam. Right. But we can see by the by the hundred year event, you know, everything is underwater. The road isn't underwater up here, but uh, but that whole floodplain area uh, of the old impoundment is underwater. Um, so those are just existing conditions. We could show you millions more slides, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what the different data types are and how you can kind of look at those. Um, so now we're just going to go through some of the flood resilience projects that we modeled. Um, so one major type of flood resilience project is floodplain reconnection, like getting the river to access floodplains that it would have 
under normal circumstances minus you know the historic channel manipulation minus the incision or down cutting that's happened um, these are floodplains that the river under natural conditions would have had access to flooding right but for all those reasons it doesn't so in 2016 we did a floodplain reconnection project here um, at what we now call the South River Meadow um, that was on town owned property and these are some photos showing you what lowering that floodplain three feet looked like and um, just after construction what that lowered reconnected floodplain looked like and that's worked great um, we've talked about that a lot on other talks um, but this is just the basic floodplain reconnection floodplain lowering sort of project so we have uh, several of those that we considered for this project uh, Rosalie and I are talking to you about today uh, one of those is lowering the floodplain area up here this is the covered bridge so we're going to refer to this as the South River floodplain lowering or the covered bridge floodplain lowering this is an area of 13 acres uh, some of it is residential um, a lot of it is fallow land and a lot of it is town owned um, the second area of floodplain lowering is along Pumpkin Hollow Brook between Old Cricket Hill Road and upstream and downstream of Maple Street. Um, this, these two polygons here, these two areas, we're looking at total about 10 acres. Um, another way to reconnect the river to its floodplain is by removing a berm. So we'll talk about that, I think, a little bit in the next slide, but this is where the berm is in uh, center of Conway, just upstream of the Main Street Bridge. So these are the three floodplain reconnection um, projects that we uh, modeled, and we're going to show you the results in a few minutes. Um, so the just a little bit more about the covered bridge site. Um, like I said, 13 acres at near the confluence with Johnny Bean Brook. This high surface of sediment here, this is what I call mm -hmm. legacy sediment. This is impoundment sediment. It's fine grained uh, silts, fine sand and clay that was deposited in the old mill pond, um, the dam of which was just downstream of the covered bridge. It fed the canal that goes along um, to Delabar mm -hmm. Avenue mm -hmm. where uh, Orchard Supply <coughs> is now in that factory. So this is sediment that is, you know, been deposited on the natural wetland surface. Um, mm -hmm. Removing that sediment over 13 acres uh, is something we wanted to model and see what kind of benefits that would have for flooding in the village downstream. Where, where does that sediment end up? That sediment, as you can see, the banks are very raw and near vertical and it's fine grained. Um, it doesn't have a lot of uh, capacity to resist scour forces. So there's, you know, probably every time it rains, there's a little bit <clears throat> of that sediment that's coming into the South River. Um, but where do you put it? Yeah. Where do you take it? Like, oh, it I'm like sorry. If you, if you bring it down, where does yeah. it go? So when we, that's a great question. When we removed uh, the sediment at South River Meadow, that was about one acre. It was lowered three feet. Um, and all that sediment, the contractor was C.D. Davenport. They took all that loam and they brought it to their yard and they probably sold it or used it on other projects. They needed clean fill or what have you. So it would be trucked off site. Um, and we'd have to think about how that would work. Um, there might be local areas um, that could take some of that, but it's definitely like a major excavation and trucking operation that we're talking about. Yeah, and, and, and they get to sell it. Do we get a, you know, who pays for the removal? But they get a benefit from it. So yeah, you'd have to you'd have to work all that out. I'm aware of some projects down in like the mid-Atlantic, they do a lot of this, mm -hmm. um, and they've actually sold the loam. Um, you know, you can yeah, sell, so sell loam for $30 a yard or whatever, so there could be some cost offset. Mm -hmm. the, the, the 
sorry, Bruce. Um, Nicholas, you go by Nicholas. Either, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, you had mentioned the tannery. Yeah. And so, uh, I remember hearing years ago about a GP plant on the Upper Hudson and, and how they dumped their PCBs into the mm -hmm. river and that ended up as part of the sediment. So, of course, it begs the question of what's in it or what could be in it and ha have there been any soil tests done thus far to determine whether that soil is good enough to be sold or if it's going to have to be treated as hazardous waste? That's a great question. So yeah, every uh, the sediment would have to be tested. Um, we don't have any reason to believe that it has contamination, uh, but it would have to be tested. Um, yeah, that's what I was about to say. <laughs> um, uh, for these types of projects, the permitting process requires testing of the sediments, mm -hmm. and you know they're, they're compared the they're tested for mm -hmm. metals, you know PCBs, PAHs, um, different types of contaminants, and compared to state standards to determine if the contractor can just take it um, or if it would need to go to either a landfill or a hazardous waste facility. I think in this setting, it may be unlikely that it's highly contaminated, um, but either way, the contractor, um, you know, it gets tested during the permitting process and then the contractor is given direction on what they're allowed to do with it. And they have to report to MassDEP where it's going to go. And so, so then, as far as due diligence from a town perspective, um, as part of the permitting process, let's say at the end of today, we say, you know, as part of your vote, which is what I read we're up to today, um, we choose one, and then they do core samples. I'm guessing they just drive a two-inch pour down into eight feet or whatever and then sample. Mm -hmm. um, if in that process you find that there's a strata or that all of it has to be treated in a different way, um, we could then reevaluate a choice or make the choice contingent upon. <laughs> I, I'm just, yeah. you know, I, looking for yeah, ways so, this could so, so we're going to get into this a little bit more when we talk about um, the proposed conditions of what these resilience projects look like. Um, but, you know, just to cut to the chase, there's not one magic bullet where one project is going to solve all the issues and that's the one we need to do. Um, they all have, there's a lot to consider about all of them. And so I think you know, it's a long-term process. Yep. Uh, we're not going to get to the point of testing sediment before June, which is when this grant ends and this contract ends. But if a, if a project like this was selected, then, in you know, you would get to that when you'd get to it. And then you could, you know, sort of... Uh, make choices. Re, yeah, it. make choices, okay. re you know, redefine, re, and re -scope. That was done presumably when the Rose property was was excavated yes. a mile, or yes. the, the one acre. So yep. if no surprises were found there, it's likely that this, which is presumably older, um, wouldn't have it either. But okay. <clears throat> so yeah, again, apologize. There's a lot of information in here, but. We'll try to get through it. So um, another type of resilience project outside of floodplain reconnection is, you know, upsizing infrastructure. So the main one we are actually going to model in this is a Main Street Bridge. Um, but in this slide, we're showing you how an undersized culvert here seen at Cricket, Old Cricket Hill Road. Um, when you upsize that, you actually need to meet state standards. And the state standard is the bank full width of the channel or, you know, the, uh, which is the wetted area plus any like bars, you know, kind of there's a way to measure that. Um, and then you have to do that by 1.2. To, so you're getting a little bit bigger than the, the wetted channel just to 
properly convey all the sediment and water um, that's going through that area. So the one of these that we're doing in this is Main Street Bridge. Main Street Bridge right now was built in 1925 and 1926. It is 39 feet wide. The bank full width of the South River is more like 65 or more feet, 70 feet. So to meet standards, we would need a span of 76 feet. So that's what we're looking at in the model. Increasing this existing mm -hmm. opening of 39 feet to 76 feet. Mm -hmm. And this is actually the old blueprint from 1925 showing you uh, looking upstream uh, at the bridge. Uh, so, and excuse me, how do you do that without changing the location of where that culvert is related to the houses that are on that corner? Yeah, I mean, you, the logic of that is pretty hard to grasp. Okay, so I'm um, getting to that right now a little bit. Um, the, there have been many bridges at this area. Yeah. There was an old wooden bridge that burned down in the mid 1800s. It was replaced by a steel truss bridge. The width of that bridge was 57.1 feet. When the state highway came in, 116, they reduced the bridge from 57 feet to 39 feet. And they put the concrete bridge in from 1925 to 26. So, that is, you know, reducing its capacity by 31%. And the houses are older than that. The houses they're, are houses. the houses yeah. are older than that. Okay, the, so there had to have been some accommodation for 57 feet. Now we're right. talking 50% greater than that. <clears throat> yeah, Did we're talking about models include. Uh, and I, I know, Nicholas, you're looking at. As an engineer, you're looking at what are the potentials here? What are the options rather than suggesting that someone loses their house? But um, at, in other words, if we touch that bridge, it's got to go to 76 feet. And do your models include, uh, can we see how that would affect the banks around and maybe overlaid on the houses in that well, area? Well, we... Um that's the next step is, you know, taking it from a theoretical model to something on paper. Yeah. <clears throat> um, that's part of this program mm -hmm. is if this is a project that gets selected, um, then we'll have to do that is, you know, look at how to lay it out. And it'll be a very preliminary conceptual plan for this phase. Um, but ideally, you know, then it would move on to the next phase of more detailed design. And we'd have to presume that if it's 76 feet wide, it's going to have to adhere to 76 for a, a distance above the bridge and also below the bridge so that you don't have a, a necking down and yeah. want to accommodate. Right. The okay. wing the wing walls will still allow for that opening. Okay. Yep. And so... so we have another question. <laughs> yeah. I'm that person, by the way. I love if people give their name when they ask questions. But I'd also love if people held their questions till the end of the presentation. Because it feels like there's so much to get through. Right. And, and, and we could get lost in these, in these very important, but very, like, nitty-gritty. That's my personal I, I somewhat concur because I feel like you have more information that we just hold off on questions. Mm -hmm. You're going to go to it. That would be more helpful. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, the, and the simple answer that maybe people are looking for is that um, we are going to be developing two conceptual designs based on the voting. Um, and so if the Main Street Bridge is one, then we will have conceptual designs for that. Main Street Bridge is uh, a state road, so mass DOT will be involved. And so the design team moving forward would be working with Mass DOT, and we would have to convince them that yes, you do actually need a 76 foot wide bridge, and this is why you need it, right? Um, so, and then uh, I think the last of the five resilience projects that we modeled was. No, not the last. 
Oh, no, not the last. <laughs> Sorry. Number four or five was a breaching or removal of this berm, which I mentioned earlier. But this is showing where the river was in 1871, coming back behind the berm. Um, you can see how Pumpkin Hollow Brook was straightened and Mains and the South River was rerouted. Um, and then we also found like the old blueprints of the berm, which they called a dike in the blueprints. Um, and there's a photo of it. Uh, so, is the thing yeah, coming? you have to click it again. All right, so the last project is a bypass channel that is taking water from Pumpkin Hollow Brook. Um, the water flows into Pumpkin Hollow Brook in our model here at this parking lot, right by the town hall, that's the town hall, um, flows into this culvert. The culvert for the purposes of the model that we designed was a rectangular box culvert, 10 feet wide, and five feet high. This culvert would be buried under the right of way along the road. This culvert runs, as I said, from the bank of Pumpkin Hollow Brook along Academy Hill Road through the, the little median here in front of the library, down Elm Street along the right of way. I would assume could be under the road, but you know, whatever made sense, we're far from getting to that sort of level of detail. Um, and then across the hayfield and where it enters the South River, um, right up directly across from the lowered area of South River Meadow. <clears throat> We're not saying this would exactly be where the bypass culvert would have to be. We just want to see, hey, if you put a, a bypass culvert that's going to take most of the water from Pumpkin Hollow Brook and put it back into the South River downstream of the village where, you know, we're concerned about flooding, what sort of benefit does that have? And so that is what we put into the model. Um, clarify? Yes. That means that that um, that that piece of Pumpkin Hollow Brook at, at the end, as it currently exists behind my house, wouldn't be there anymore. Uh, the the brook would remain. You would just have uh, another way for water to flow. You know. So, uh, and we calculated that that could take about what, 500, 500 uh, cubic so. feet per second, which is a pretty big flow uh, of Pumpkin Hollow Brook, most of the water. And we can look at event size again. Does it do have impacts in terms of speed and all the flow you're talking about earlier? Yeah, so all this, rejoins, yeah, so we, uh, yeah, you can model flow depth, you can model water surface, you can model velocity. Right? Um, and then entry height. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then, so we also, you know, considered some other mo projects, which, you know, I mentioned earlier, Old Cricket Hill Road culvert, Maple Street culvert, um, just for, um, you know, time issues and things. We didn't actually model um, upsizing those, um, but those would probably have more localized impacts. Um, along Pumpkin Hollow and not necessarily along the South River in downtown. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Rosalie and she's going to go through the actual model results. So what I've been talking about previously was the existing conditions. Now we're going to look at some of these um, proposed conditions and how changing that geometry uh, changes the model. And, OK, so just to kind of reorient ourselves, here's a map. Um, these are the five projects that we have voting boxes for, um, and we'll, I'll be showing the results of the modeling for these five projects. Um, with that said, you know, the, the projects that Nick just mentioned, widening culverts along Pumpkin Hollow Brook, um, those still have merit, um, and, you know, the work that the town could pursue in the future could could go on for a while if they, you know, want to, all of these projects would have merit. Um, but right now we need to prioritize two of them to start to start with. So again, the first project number one is to enlarge the Main Street Bridge that's in this location. Um, number two is the floodplain lowering 
upstream of the covered bridge here. Number three is the floodplain lowering along Pumpkin Hollow Brook, which is actually down, down in this area here. And then four is the berm removal, just upstream of Main Street. And five is the flood diversion culvert, which would take, you know, normal flows would still be in Pumpkin Hollow Brook, but when the water starts to rise during a flood, those extra flows would go into the culvert. Um, and then I also want to say that when with modeling these projects, we have to start somewhere, you know, as if for any of these projects that would be selected, as the design progresses, we could refine the modeling to get more um, detailed information about what's actually happening. For example, the diversion culvert, we said, well, let's look at a 10 by 5. Maybe it could actually be bigger. If we were to design it, we could look more at, you know, the alternatives for that project in and of itself. And also, you know, how does the water get into it? You know, all those things would go into the design for that. Um, so looking at results, um, this is for the project to widen the Main Street Bridge to a width of 76 feet. Um, these, re these are showing the results for the 10-year flood. Um, so the, um, the top graph, sorry, okay, yeah, so these are the 10-year results. Um, so you can see that in the 10-year, you're reducing the peak of the flow and the, the depth, actually. This is the depth. Um, so there's about a nine inch reduction in that peak depth, but um, the velocity is reduced by about 40%. So you're really allowing that water to get through without that constriction that's, you know, increasing the force and the velocity of the water. And the next slide shows that um, where, you know, during the 10 year flood, um, this is the existing bridge. You can see this red you know, high level velocity through here and the average, the peak velocity is 8.4 feet per second. And then with the higher span bridge, it's about, it's reduced to about 4.8 um, feet per second. Um, and, you know, that can mean the difference between being okay with not having to like um, put a ton of big, large stones, you know, along, along there. Um, so it does relieve that, that velocity through there. And just to add, anyone who's lived in Conway for a while will, will have seen some of that uh, scour force right at the Main Street Bridge because the retaining wall has failed, you know, three times over, over the years. Um, and so this is the kind of benefit reducing that scour force. So this is another uh, view of the impacts of widening the bridge. Um, so the purple is the 10 year inundation limits um, with the widened bridge, but you can see the yellow is where there's more flooding with the, the smaller bridge opening. Okay, and then just, you know, getting the picture of the different types of flood events with widening the bridge. Um, the depth through the bridge um, is a little under seven feet in a two year. Um, and in the 10 year, it's up to about 12 and a half feet. And then the 100 year is 14, over 14 feet. Um, and when you widen the bridge, you're reducing that depth by about eight inches in the two year and the 10 year storm. Um, and there's not a significant change in the 100 year event there. All right. Where's road level? Um, I, well, I think, you know, you are get. I don't know the specific numbers off the top of my head, but you are getting um, you know, there's a certain level of freeboard, which means you want 
some space between the bottom of the bridge and the top of the water, so you're improving that freeboard um, with widening the bridge. Okay, so the floodplain lowering, this is looking at the, lo the lowering of the floodplain upstream of the covered bridge. Um, so on the left is um, in the 10 year storm, this area does get flooded already. So the yellow is showing, okay, so existing conditions in the 10 year event, that floodplain area does get inundated with water. Um, if we cut down that floodplain and remove that leg legacy sediment to an additional depth of five feet, um, you know, those other areas get filled in with floodwaters. Um, and what that does downstream is that it, if, you, if you're using the Main Street Bridge location as your um, point of comparison, um, it does result in you know, almost a foot decrease in depth of water at that location. So storing additional water upstream will re result in reducing the flooding downstream. Right. Um, and then this is showing also for the floodplain lowering at the covered bridge um, that the 10 year event, um, the depth at the bridge, how it's decreased. Um, and we did look at two options, you know, if we reduce the floodplain by two feet versus five feet. So that's kind of showing the difference there. All right, and this graphic um, is showing that same section that Nick showed earlier with the existing conditions where um, the town, oops, the town hall I think is in this area. Yeah, right at the edge of the graph. Yeah, so this goes from the tannery, the old tannery, um, upstream of Main Street Bridge over to the front door of the town hall. Right, so at the river, you know, it's over a foot of lowering um, and then as that water spreads out, it's a little bit less of a dramatic decrease, but over by the town hall, it's about four inch um, lowering there as a result of lowering that floodplain upstream of the covered bridge. Is the tannery a foundation now? Yes. Okay. I'll explore. Um, so this is looking at what happens if we lower the floodplain um, along Pumpkin Hollow Brook. So this also, um, we lowered the floodplain by about two feet. So you take the existing flooded area and expand it in that vicinity, but then you have the result of lowering the peak at Main Street from a little over 13 feet to about 12 and a half feet. And then you can see, you know, the decrease in the extent of inundation in the area. Um, so the South River berm removal um, in the 10 year storm. So the berm, you can see here this little area here that's not inundated in the existing condition. So basically we modeled kind of cutting that down so that um, these little white dots are the flow arrows. So you can see that the berm is kind of pushing, trying to push the water to get back this way. Um, whereas here without the berm, these flow arrows are going straight down. So it does allow for the, the water in the river to get out onto that floodplain. Um, it does not have a huge impact in a 10 year event or a large, you know, very large flood event. In smaller, you know, everyday events where it might actually help conditions at the bridge because you are allowing for that water to get out on, onto the floodplain. 
Yeah, and there, there might be some velocity uh, benefits. Um, there's also going to be benefits uh, with sediment storage. Um, and the model doesn't do a good job of that. And we have to remind ourselves that what we're talking about is water flowing. We're also talking about sediment flowing with that water, right? So anytime we can open up a floodplain and that floodplain is going to have sediment deposited on it during a flood, that sediment that's not ending up downstream or, you know, in the channel bar causing more erosion or in your farm field downstream, right? So um, while the inundation benefits aren't really, you know, quantifiable here with removing the berm, there would be other benefits associated. Mm -hmm. And one thing, you know, that we did not pursue but could be considered in the future is looking at actually lowering that floodplain in the area to see if that could increase the benefits of removing the berm. Um, and then this is, these are just some more graphics showing that, um, you know, where the, the berm was located and that there's not a huge difference there in a 10 year event. Um, the bypass culvert, um, so, you know, having that bypass culvert to take some of the flood flows out of Academy Hill Brook and then send it um, back into the South River downstream of Conway Center um, does result in a decrease in the extent of flooding. Um, so the yellow would be under existing conditions and the blue is with that culvert in place. Um, and then on the right, we combined two options, which is if you had the bypass culvert and also the widening of the bridge um, into one model. So the pink is showing that additional reduction in flooding extent there. Um, and then this graph is showing the depth um, at the main street bridge during a 10 year. Um, these are upside down. So <laughs> the current is at the top and that's a depth of 13.4 feet. With the bypass culvert, the depth at the bridge is 12 and a half feet. So almost a foot reduced. And then with those two projects together, it's down to 11.2 feet. So you have, um, with those two projects together, you mm -hmm. reduce the depth of flooding at the bridge of, at, of about two feet. All right, so we're wrapping up. Um, so this is a summary of these project types and benefits and limitations. Um, so in general, um, floodplain reconnection, whether that's by lowering a floodplain or removing berms, um, it offers an increase in the storage of flood water, um, ideally in a location that where the flood water can be accommodated so that you're reducing flooding in areas downstream where you don't want that flood water. Um, it improves downstream water quality, so, you know, Having water access the floodplains, as Nick was saying, allows for de deposition of sediments. So you're trapping those sediments and reducing um, the peak flux of sediments and nutrients to downstream locations. Um, and also provides benefits for habitat. Um, I think the limitation is, you know, finding available areas, um, constraints, and how just how much floodplain you can add or or allow the river to access can limit the, the benefit you get downstream. Um, some other limitations are, you know, there may be changes in vegetation. If, if the area is currently forested, some of those trees might have to come out. Um, on the flip side, if you have an area that's, um, you know, uh, overtaken by invasive species, you could as part of the project, you could remove those invasive species and, and then, you know, restore that area to a more natural habitat. Um, so the bridge or culvert widening, um, 
depending on the scenario, it should allow for some reduction in flood depth and, and extent of flood inundation. Uh, I think more importantly, having what you know a, a bridge or a culvert that's wide enough to accommodate the river um, reduces that scour and erosion potential and potential for for failures. Um, and then in the case of Main Street, the structure is you know due for replacement just based on its age. Um, and there are there could be potential impacts to the abutting properties. Um, you know how that bridge is placed, the designers, the engineers that have to do the best that they can to place it and design the abutments to hold it in a way that will limit impacts to abutting properties. Um, the flood diversion culvert, um, the advantage of something like this is that you can, you know, we, we can't necessarily just remove development. Um, we can see that the river wants to flood around Conway Center and we can't move, necessarily move everything, but what this does is it allows to take some of that flood water and get it away from the developed areas and back to the river in a location where it won't have an adverse effect. Um, and in this case, we see that it does provide a reduction in the flood inundation and flood depth. Um, it's not a nature-based approach, um, unfortunately, but and it may have somewhat of a high cost. And um, you know, putting in an underground tunnel is is not a small a small project, but so. <laughs> but it has been done. It has been done, and, yeah. and I've seen it done in much more dense developed areas um, than this area, where you do have a path that would be mostly within a right of way, um, and there aren't structures in the way to, to deal with. Um, all right, so our next steps for this project that is going to wrap up at the end of June with this MVP grant is to actually prepare reports of the modeling methodology and results. Um, when we are going to prepare conceptual designs for the two projects that are prioritized by everyone that, that submits their votes, um, along with cost opinions for those two projects. Um, and then the town will pursue further grant funding to advance those designs. Um, so we'll take, we'll have some time for questions and discussion, and then um, I'll explain the voting after that. I'm curious a little bit more about the why. Oh, I'm Cheryl Case. I'm curious about widening the, um, the bridge here. Mm -hmm. If uh, you said it's a state road, what happens if it fails? Like if there's a flood and it breaks, or it's, you said it's getting old, is and the state gets involved? Do they have parameters that are like this? Would they want to widen it also, or would they say just we can make it however you want it? So um, the state guidelines say that you are supposed to build the bridge at 1.2 times the bank full width. So that's to so they, accommodate the channel, which oh. we say is 76 feet. Yeah, the, but if there's an existing bridge, there's leeway to not build it that wide because of um, any other constraints that may prevent you from doing that allow for that leeway to not it's not a requirement it is definitely a requirement if you were to build a new crossing like a driveway a new driveway or something um, but for an existing bridge um, it's not a 100 percent requirement but it but it that's the guidance and yeah. i think that you know with our involvement in this study um you know we could apply some you know Maybe applying pressure may not be the right word, but you know, like our, oppression, our professional opinion based on a lot of evidence, including historical evidence, including this model, shows that you know what the bridge, an appropriately sized crossing, needs to be. Right, so. Hi, Linda McDaniel. Um, I live on Quickie Road. Um, I'm curious with all of these plans. Flooding is not eliminated. 
Is that right? Mm -hmm. Even under the two year. Um, so what we're doing here is mitigating to a certain extent, but there will still be flooding, um, serious flooding um, in town. I'm just, the benefit of doing all of this, is it warranted by the results that we, we get, that we will see? So maybe you don't get flooded in your basement and your house isn't, you know, I, every five years, but maybe, you know, you can still expect it to happen every 10 years, right? Right. Well, that's, I mean, is it worth it is ultimately up to the community to decide. Um, what I think we could say is that you get the best results, the most benefits from stacking some of these resiliency, you know, solutions, right? So um, I'm just going to make up numbers right now, but like, so at the 10 year flow, widening the bridge, you saw like an eight inch reduction, right? At the 10 year flow, lowering the floodplain um, near the covered bridge, you saw an additional foot of reduction, you know? Bypass channel, that was nine inches. So by the time you add those up, that could be the difference between the 10 year flood flooding your basement or the 10 year flood not, right? Or it could be the difference between, you know, uh, a hundred year flood looking like a 25 year flood. You know, it's it's somewhat, it's gonna be a question of how often, how frequent these events are and how they're impacting you on a day-to-day -day basis. But, um, but I think, yeah, there's, the results are not, they're not, you know, I think they're, they're hopeful in that we do see benefits to all these approaches. Um, and the more you can do, it's going to make a difference. Sir. Yeah. Um, so even further upstream is the old uh, Tucker and Cook Reservoir. Which, yes. Which I own now. And, um, you know, I know that we've talked at some point about lowering that. It, it seems like in the context of these results here, that would be worth looking at again mm -hmm. more seriously because that would have at least, I would think, the same effect as as the uh, low upstream lowering you're talking by the Brooklyn Bridge. So, and in terms of uh, any potential uh, sediment that would be uh, sort of anything to worry about, because it's upstream of wherever the tannery and you know, any of the mills, mm -hmm. and I would think that the chances of you know, any mercury or anything like that would be essentially zero. From, from, yeah. So I, I would think that anybody would, you know, they could use that sediment. And they're welcome to it. I also want to point out, I'm more than happy if that's turned into a floodplain because it's it, it's currently doing all the things, the horrible things you're talking about. That's that's great. Oh, so yeah, Mr. Manuel, sorry for not you know uh, following up with you as you know fervently as we could have. So that's definitely definitely Take an option. Yeah. That's definitely an option, and I think uh, you bring up an important point because landowner buy-in and like ultimately some of these parcels are privately owned and so nothing could be done without that landowner um, being a proponent and signing on to the project so knowing that you are you know willing to explore that option is very good information for the town to have and uh, for anyone who doesn't know that's the old um, you know Conway Reservoir or the uh, Tucker and Cook Reservoir some people call it um, and the banks are very high at the downstream end. Some, in some places, it's like 10 feet. So you can remove 10 feet of sediment over, over an area. So it could definitely have a you know, quantifiable impact. Um, Is that right adjacent to Ashfield Road? Uh, Eldridge Road oh, okay. yep, is where the old dam is. Yeah. So lots of, lots of questions. We'll get to everybody. <laughs> Is there, isn't it, if you're increasing the main, the main street bridge from 39 to 70 something, isn't there a slide that shows where that, I mean, it seems so straightforward. You have the houses, you have the, the in, whatever. I mean, can't you tell now before we vote? Do you take people's front yards? I mean, I, I don't understand that. I don't live in that area, but, you know, um, it seems pretty simple, but maybe I'm missing something. You're saying if, you, don't, if, you can't tell, but it seems to me that's a very 
very straightforward. If Roy, that, yeah, if I'm that is what you have. Here. Sorry. Yeah, if that is one of the designs that the town thinks should move forward, then we would put together a conceptual plan that would show and an option of where it would fit. If it's the right means, if you, I mean, in other words, each step doesn't doesn't mean you're going to take the next step because of a vote. I mean, well, we're going to learn more. Yeah, I think the vote should be considered a prioritization. You know, what are your but how do you know what's a priority if you're looking at taking 30 feet out of the side of the street? I, 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 well, we don't have it today. I, I think maybe you can say it's going to, it would be twice the span, and we know where Deborah's house and Roger's house, and, you know, we know where they are. But so. it doesn't go to eat any of either any of those two rows of houses. It doesn't impact other than their front yard. I'm sure it would. But, so, you know, we don't have it today, also, but we can imagine what it would be because it's twice what it is now. So well, we and, you know, I think if you were standing out there, I think there's maybe more space than you think mm -hmm. there is in your memory. Um, what was the size leverage? Because this was 35. So, so it was an interim one before. Yes. This was 50 so yeah. we're talking an additional. Fif it was 57. So we're talking additional 13 feet wide. Not talking height, not talking width. We're just talking width. We're just talking width. Yeah. 13 feet, you say? So, so it went from it went from 57 to 39. It went it it decreased from it, the old bridge was 57 feet. Then they built the 39 foot bridge, which is what we have now. Yeah. We're saying it needs to be even bigger, It'd be yeah. 76. But we don't know what that would look like. No, well, that's I don't know. Know. We, we just no. no, we didn't map that yet. Bill? Um, Bill Cantor, River Street. So the one thing that you didn't address, and I don't know, maybe you don't think it's pertinent, but of your alternatives, um, which are most likely to receive future grant funding? I mean, for, for, for a lot of this town, the ability to pay for these projects is first and foremost. Um, so, and not having to pay for these projects is a very good thing. Um, so, so of the of these things, which is most doable when it could, because all of these, the, the whole plan of all of this is to continue to apply for future grants. Um, which of these have the greatest chance of success? That, that, can I add, like, my question is related to that as well. Mm -hmm. There seems to be, in the way that you're asking us to vote, no, like, risk assessment related to the financial support for each part of the project. Like, does the bypass, because it helps a state road, like, is that only municipal funding versus a bridge, which is a combination of state funding and municipal funding, like there's no part, like we're being asked to vote on prioritize uh, without knowing that financial s potential structure. And also in each of these projects, what is the number of landowners per project that have to participate in an agreement? So that's another component of what I would call risk management. And that's not articulated as well. And it feels like those are both really critical aspects to how you right. put, nor is it sequence, so that these two projects get you the equivalent of 12 and a half, uh, a foot and a half, and these two projects get you um, 10 and a half. And then, you know, like, what's the, like, we're paying for everything at one point, whereas you're splitting it with the state in another point. Like, it just seems to me that that's, it's premature to even prioritize without some of that evidence, unless it's in the package, um, being included. So the, the floodplain lowering projects um, would be, I think those would be good candidates for funding, additional funding from this MVP program that we are, um, that's funding this 
portion of the project. Um, because they are nature-based approaches, um, the flood diversion channel, I think it would be worth talking to um, the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency to get their feedback on FEMA grant funding. Um, FEMA's goals are flood mitigation, regardless of whether or not it's, you know, hard infrastructure or um, nature-based. Um, they support both types of projects, but and FEMA does really look at a, a benefit cost analysis approach. Um, and then I think, yes, the bridge, you know, as that's a DOT structure, then um, talking to DOT and, and getting state funding involved with that would be would be the approach there. Um, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so you're, that's, I think that's a good answer. Yeah, so there's different pots of money that each type of project could come from, but um, they're all going to be, you know, have associated costs, but hopefully a lot of that could be, you know, would not be on the, the taxpayers of Conway. Um, as far as some of the other comments about, um, you know, we would have liked to have had more in this at this point, right? But the reality is that we have a project, you have nine months to do it. Um, you know, the scope of what we were talking about was really focused on model and like potential benefits, not really getting into the nitty gritty of like, you know, knocking on landowners' doors, getting them to sign a letter saying they're, you know, um, they're guess, signing on to it, or, you know, um, you know, survey level things of like figuring out where people's pins are next to the Main Street Bridge. Like that would all come in the next phase of anything, right? right. So it's just kind of, I know it's frustrating because it's like how these things are sequenced. Some of it is just the grant funding cycle. You get the grant in October. It's got to be done by by June. And so it's And right now what this, we are. this vote is simply to decide which of these two projects do you want to see more on paper? You know, which of these two projects would you like to see advanced to then um, you know, have visuals, more visuals of what this will look like. Um, but that doesn't remove the other projects from the table completely. So that's my question. There's quite a few questions back here. Uh, okay. Figure it out amongst yourselves, I guess. <laughs> very, very quickly. Questioning that someone has asked for <coughs> should announce ourselves. Oh, sorry, started. John Harrison from Baptist Road. Uh, I just want to calibrate something. And you might have said this, I might have missed it. 